Ohinu, Melech Haralem, Asher, Kishanu, Bemitzvata, Betsibani, La Sak Bintere, Torah. Please, Jehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Best are you, Jehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Children can go. Everyone else can open up their Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. We are now moving into chapter 5, and today we will start with verse 1, and we will finish with verse 1. That's how we roll. Amen. Sister Gail, I know you're not like wrapped up like you called. May the Lord bless you. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, I <coughs> subtitled it, Yeshua the Messiah. We are actually in uh, part 37, so we're 37 weeks into it. I got an email from someone from Texas. They've been uh, going through the YouTubes and, and following us in 1 John. They're very excited about what is um, the teaching, and so I just want you to know that, you know, you reach more than what you see. Uh, many people are listening and, and paying attention, so they, they write me and are encouraged by the teachings. So let's look at 1 John chapter 5. We'll look at verse 1. It says, Everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah has God as his Father, and everyone who loves the Father loves his offspring too. So when we look at the opening chapter <clears throat> of chapter 5, it's not a chapter break or a new theme or subject. I know that a lot of times when we look at it because it's in English, it seems like there's a new theme that's going to happen because it's a chapter break and there's something else that's happening in the next chapter. But the opening verses of this chapter are actually linked to chapter 4. And in fact, the word love, and it's both its noun and verbal forms, is actually found five times in the first three verses. And anytime you find something being used five times over and over again, then, you know, when I learned in school, those things are important, Right? And yet we find it also <clears throat> not only focuses on love, but it also focuses on saving faith. The act of believing in the person and work of Yeshua that results in eternal salvation. So we look at the word group, faith um, or to believe, in this epistle. We find it primarily in chapter 5, and we find that seven times in chapter 5. So John is trying to teach us something. And what he's trying to teach us is that saving faith and love are bound together. Did you hear what I said? Faith and love are bound together. True faith always issuing in love <clears throat> and love being then the visible fruit of saving faith. Love being the visible fruit. We know that we have fruit of the Spirit, correct? Correct. And if you have faith, then that means you have the Father. You have the Father, that means you have the Son. You have the Son, means you have the Spirit. If you have the Spirit, that means you're going to be bearing fruit. And not just bearing fruit because you say you have fruit, but visible fruit. I will be able to see it. How do you know that an orange tree is an orange tree? You see that it's producing oranges. If someone says that's an orange tree and it has lemons, you know that someone is lying and it's not the tree. Right? So, <clears throat> again, saving faith is not summed up in some mere mental assent at what is true. Because a lot of people believe that Yeshua is the Son of God. A lot of people believe in Yeshua. They mentally believe in Him. If you said, do you believe that Yeshua existed? Do you believe that He died and rose again? Most people, even if they don't have any relationship with God, will probably tell you yes. <clears throat> they believe in God. They believe in Jesus. They believe in Yeshua. But they have this mental assent to what is true. And what we understand is, is that your faith is not a mental understanding. It is a heart issue. You have made a decision. <clears throat> you have decided that Yeshua is the Messiah and you have accepted him and you follow him. And because it is a heart issue, then there's going to be fruit of such faith. And the fruit of such faith is love. There's a lot of other fruit. But the greatest fruit will be love. 
So love for Yehovah is seen through obeying him. Remember, <clears throat> if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and you will love him with all your first heart, and then your soul, and then your might or your resources. So love for Yehovah is seen through obeying him, and then not only obeying him, but loving one another. So faith in Yehovah and the Messiah Yeshua, as well as love for other believers, is that which characterizes the true child of Yehovah. This is not a judgment. This is an observation. It's not a judgment. It's written in the book that tells you this is how you will know them, and you will know them by this. So if you do not see how you will know them, then most likely they are not them. Their father is someone different. So if we look at 1 John 5, 1 through 3, even though we're only going over one, <clears throat> we find that the opening verses of 1 John 5 may therefore be outlined along these lines. So let's look. Uh, everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah has God as his father, and everyone who loves a father loves his offspring too. Here is how we know that we love God's children. When we love God, we also do what he commands, for loving God means obeying his commands. Moreover, his commands are not what? Burdensome. How many know what it means when he says his commands are not burdensome? They're not hard. What makes them hard? We do, right? We make it hard. <clears throat> we make it hard because we don't want to do them. That's the bottom line. So we can outline this. We can say, first of all, <clears throat> chapter 5, 1 and 5 talks about a right belief, which that right belief is believing in Yeshua. Number two, righteousness or obedience to Yehovah's commands we find in 5, 2, 3. Because if you have a right belief, then you will walk in righteousness, which means you will obey the commands because this is what will make you righteous, right? You have no righteousness in your own self. Your own righteousness is filthy rags, correct? And then we can break it down to number three, that you, to love Yehovah, and then also to love other people, which we find in 5, 1 through 3. So if we just outline verses 1 through 3, that would be a very simple outline. <clears throat> you have the right belief, which calls you to be righteous and obey God's commands, and it also causes you then to love Yehovah and also love other believers. So in fact, what we find is John has kind of organized the phrases of these verses in a uh, chiastic arrangement. Now, how many know what a chiastic arrangement is? A chiastic arrangement is that he starts with a theme, and then he goes through a couple other <clears throat> principles, and then in the middle, <clears throat> he repeats that theme, and then he goes backwards. So he starts with Yeshua being the Messiah. He talks about then commandments, and he talks about loving. Then he talks about loving, and then he talks about commandments, and he talks about Yeshua the Messiah. So it's, in a, it's a, a way that he writes in order for him to give to you or stress to you a very simple but very powerful truth that faith and love are always combined. So if we would just look at it very quickly in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, I have A1 and B1 and C1 and D1, then I have D2 and <clears throat> B2 and C2. And what that does, he starts with believing that Yeshua is the Messiah, and he ends with believing that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God. He's repeating himself, but in reverse order. And he's doing that to emphasize <clears throat> that the love for Yehovah and each other is at the center of genuine faith, because at the center of this chiastic arrangement is love of God and love for each other. So it's the way that he just emphasizes something. And so that such love, the love that we have for Yehovah and the love that we have for one another, both for uh, Yehovah and each other, is the fruit of obeying Yehovah's commands. <clears throat> the reason why you can't love one another is because you don't obey his commands. The reason why you don't love him is because you don't obey his commands. And I'm not talking to you because you, you love him and you obey his commands. And you obey his commands and you love each other. Correct? But that's how you do it, by obeying his commands. Because he says, don't pick an offense. So if you don't uh, hold on to an offense, you are obeying the commands. If he tells you not to have unforgiveness, you are obeying the commands. And those commands are toward this way, right? 
<clears throat> horizontal and not vertical. Our love for him is that we love him with our heart, soul, and resources. And the same is with that second command where we love then each other with our heart and our soul and our resources. Because number two is the same as number one. So let's look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone, <clears throat> or other translations would say whoever, everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah. So whoever believes that Yeshua is the Messiah. Now we have to understand, and you know it and I know it, but we just need to make sure that we are on the same page, that only through Yeshua is atonement for sin. You don't get baptized and have atonement for sin. You don't become a church member and have atonement for sin. You don't come to church and have atonement for sin. You don't pray at the altar and have atonement for sin. It, the atonement for sin is through Yeshua, the Messiah. You must accept him into your heart. It's the only way that we stand righteous before Yehovah uh, <clears throat> so that we can be received into eternal life because you don't have any other way in. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. There's only one door and one road, one gate, and that road is narrow, right? And it's also straight. It's straight and it's narrow and very few people enter in. So when we look at 1 John chapter 2, 22, because we have the scriptures that back it up, it says, who is a liar at all, if not the person who denies that Yeshua is the Messiah? Such a person is an anti-Messiah. He is denying the Father and the Son. It's very important that if you do not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, you not only deny the Son, you deny the Father. You cannot deny the Son and believe in the Father. Same way he says, you can't love me and, and not love your brother. You're a liar. You can't say, I love the Father and don't believe in Yeshua. It's impossible. <clears throat> 1 John 4, 2. Here is how you recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit which acknowledges that Yeshua the Messiah came as a human being is from God. 1 John 4, 14 and 15. Moreover, we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as deliverer of the world. And if someone acknowledges that Yeshua is the Son of God... God remains united with him and he with God. So that's our central truth. <clears throat> now to you it might not be a big thing, but there is a movement within the world today that is denying <clears throat> Yeshua as the son of God. If they just say he's a prophet, then you've denied him to be the son of God. <clears throat> he is more than a prophet. So if someone says, oh, I believe in him, and I believe he's a good man, or I believe that he's a prophet, no, you don't understand. He is more, he is a prophet, he is a teacher, he is a preacher, he is an evangelist. But he is, our central truth is, he has to be and is the son of God. He is Emmanuel, wrapped in flesh. This is our central truth. 1 John chapter 1, 1 and 2 says, the word which gives life. He existed from the beginning. <clears throat> we have heard him. We have seen him with our eyes. We have contemplated him. We have touched him with our hands. The life appeared. We have seen it. We are testifying to it, announcing it to you. Eternal life. He was with the Father, and he appeared to us. Again, salvation, and what John is talking about, of course, John is talking the same thing that Yeshua said. He wants you to understand there is no other way through to the Father in Heaven, eternal salvation, other than Yeshua. Bottom line. So this salvation is a one-to-one -one reality in which the individual believer has died with Messiah and risen in new life in him. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 says, Don't you know that those of us who have been immersed into the Messiah Yeshua have been immersed into his death? Through immersion into his death, we were buried with him, so that just as through the glory of the Father, the Messiah was raised from the dead, likewise we too might live a new life. That we might live a what? To live a new life means you have to be transformed. You can't be transformed by your own works <clears throat> because you are like a dog that returns back to its own vomit. You need the power of the Ruach in your life, right? Right? For if we have been united with him in a death like his, 
we will also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> Yeshua died for us, correct? We could not pay the penalty for our sin. We don't have enough righteousness to do it. However, even though Yeshua died for us, we also must die to ourselves. So he died for our sins, but now we must die to ourselves because what we want is our own stuff. <clears throat> and we also must die to us. We are co-laborers with him. He didn't do it all, though he did it all. He's now responding and wants us to do it also. If he has died, he wants us also to die because his death brings him to resurrection and our death will bring us to resurrection. Because we love the Father, because we accept the Son, we love the Father. The Father then gives us the Spirit, and the Spirit then allows us to walk in obedience to Him. So while there is clearly a corporate reality to our eternal salvation, because Ephesians chapter 4 talks about a corporate understanding, because it's not only an individual thing, it's also a corporate thing, right? Because you are children of God. So you're not just a child. You're not the only child in the household of God. Right? <clears throat> normally, all except for Gail, normally, children who are only children, no other siblings, can end up being slightly spoiled. They haven't had the opportunity for conflict between siblings. Correct? They haven't had the opportunity for those challenges that happen from an older and a younger and a middle child, right? So <clears throat> God knows that he doesn't have just one child. It is a household, so our salvation is not only individually a reality, it's also a corporate reality, and the body of the Messiah is made up, though, of individuals. So the body is only as good as our own relationship with Yehovah. Right? Which is why we all must maintain an individual relationship so that the corporate body can also function in a very powerful way. So in 1 John 5, 1, he says, whoever believes. So that word believes in the Greek, and I have it up there in the Greek, is a present participle which denotes the regular and ongoing character of the person. Or if I said it another way, Faith is that which characterizes the overall life of a true believer. So here is a symbol of someone who believes. They believe it more than a week. It's ongoing. Are you sitting here in sinless perfection? <clears throat> no. But you're ongoing. You never leave him. You never walk away from him. Yes, you might wonder this or that, but you're still striving, you're still trying, you might not be as good as you were, you might not be as good today as you were yesterday, but you're, you're striving, you're trying, right? So this one who believes is someone who, <clears throat> on a regular and ongoing character of that person, faith that is evident by a life of obedience to Yehovah, a life lived out in accordance with his righteous standards, which means you are striving every day to live out this word of God in your life. And sometimes it's easy, and sometimes you make it hard, depending on what you want. So this union with the Messiah means a union with him in his death. He died for you, you die for him. He has been raised by God, Accepting that atonement of sin, you also will be raised because the atonement was accepted. So you have a new life. Don't think, well, I'm going to wait to the end when I, you know, the dead and Christ shall rise first. No, you should have a new life now. <clears throat> you should have a new life now. When did Yeshua die for you? In the beginning of time, right? So... This is what Yaakov emphasizes in, in James 2.26, or Yaakov 2.26. Indeed, <clears throat> just as the body without a spirit is dead. So let's just, so we understand. You do know that if you collapsed on the ground, something's wrong with you physically, 
you will survive as long as your spirit remains in you. When will you be called dead? When your spirit has left you, right? <clears throat> so your body shuts down, everything shuts down, then your, body, your, your spirit leaves you, correct? So that means your body only has life because the spirit, right? Which is why even if you're on, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, life support, the life support just keeps the functioning of the, of, the, um, <clears throat> of the body going. You might not be there, though, okay? Because, you know, scientifically, we can keep something going, right? Whether it's that <clears throat> present of spirit or absence of, of spirit. So <clears throat> faith, then, according to Yaakov, uh, just as the body without a spirit is dead, so to faith without actions is also dead. So the evidence that your faith is operating is actions. There has to be something that's visible, fruit. So let's go back to 1 John 5, 1. <clears throat> that Yeshua is the Messiah. Whoever believes that Yeshua is the Messiah points to the infrutable, <clears throat> irrefutable fact that Yeshua is Messiah that's been prophesied by the prophets. There's no other Messiah. There's no other way to go. There's, there's not uh, Muhammad or, or, or Buddha or any other religion, any other way. It's not a moon god, a sun god. It is the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who has sent his son, Yeshua HaMashiach, right? <clears throat> this has a applica application, application, this is very important for today. For the simple reason for this, we are living in a day and age where people are actually teaching, <clears throat> especially for observant Jews, that because they are religiously observant and following the Torah, that God has some sort of a special way for them to get in. And, and we find it a lot of times in some of the mega churches, and I won't mention any names, but <clears throat> they really believe that if they are following the Torah and really believe in the Father, that they are going to be saved somehow in a different way. But we all know, even John was saying, <clears throat> that the only way to salvation is through Yeshua. And again, if we remind us what he said, if you do not believe in the Son, you do not believe in the Father. So even if it looks like you love him and follow him and do things because of him, you don't believe in him. So even though we love the Jewish people, <clears throat> a genuine love for those who are lost in their sin is to give them the good news of the gospel as it's centered in the work of Yeshua. Same thing for our own people here today. Same thing for your family. Your family must know that the center, the only way to salvation <clears throat> is through Yeshua. Not that they attend here, not that they're a part of your house. My children must come to the saving knowledge of Yeshua, not just because I'm a preacher are they going to be saved. It doesn't work that way. Just because they're good moral people doesn't mean they're saved. There has to be <clears throat> this receiving Yeshua, and when you receive Yeshua, because the Father has called you, there is going to be a visible fruit that is coming from your life. Right? For the gospel is the power of Yehovah resulting in salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also then to the Greek, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. So 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who believes... That Yeshua is the Messiah, is born of Yehovah, or has God as his father, or born of Yehovah. <clears throat> well, that word born in Greek is the perfect tense, and it indicates an event that took place at a point in time, but which continues on in the course of time to be evident and active. Now, we're adult people here, correct? So we know <clears throat> that the only way for a woman to have a child is what? 
to conceive. And how do they conceive? They conceive when the male <clears throat> brings forth the sperm, correct? And it ignites with the egg. Now, we know that the sperm must travel to find the egg, right? Which means <clears throat> the sperm is going after the egg. You all getting nervous? You okay? All right? Which means, and I know in our, our day and age today, you know, we think we can get have pregnant and have children any way we want to. But, <clears throat> and they're trying to, you know, create things out of whatever. But it's the same. There has to be <clears throat> the, the sperm going to the egg before that is ignited. And when that is ignited, then <clears throat> if, if it's the will of God, a baby is crea created, correct? Now, at that moment, a birth has taken place. A birth of a baby has taken place. If you believe <clears throat> in when life begins, it be begins when? At conception. So that means there was a birth that happened. <clears throat> now, over the course of time, there will be evidence that a baby was born because there will be another birth, the removal from that baby from the womb. Correct? <clears throat> so there is a conception that is orchestrated by the father. Then there will be this, over the course of time, evidence and activity that that has happened and a baby will come out of that womb, correct? And then it will continue to grow. And sometimes you think it's not human, but there will be evidence somewhere along down the road that, yes, they are human. They are not an alien. You will be thinking sometimes, maybe not, but it is. <clears throat> so here's the thing. I want to make this connection for you. Whoever believes that Yeshua is the Messiah is what? Born by who? Of God. You will never accept Yeshua and be born into the family as a child of the Father unless the Father has initiated you being born. You cannot be born without the Father initiating it. I don't care what science is saying today. What we find is we're trying to clone things without a father and you can't do it. We look like a Christian, sometimes act even like a Christian, <clears throat> but you are not one. You can worship like one, say amen like one, but you are not one unless the father has initiated and there was a birth. And when there is a birth, there is a new life. So the sovereign work of Yehoah began in eternity past, working out in the course of human history. And I've said this before, and you remember, <clears throat> from the beginning of time, because Yeshua was, the word was in the beginning. He went from the beginning, he went to the end, remember? And he looked at you and he said to you what? I like you, <clears throat> and he set his love on you. <clears throat> he died in the beginning of time, which means... He gave birth to you in the beginning of time, but it took some course of time for it to be active and to be seen, visible. Some of you struggle with it and fought him tooth and nail, but his love held on to you. Right? You caused him to be pregnant with you for a very long time. More than nine months. More like what an elephant carries their child or their elephant. <clears throat> Some of you fought tooth and nail. But here's the thing. When were you born? When he initiated that love on you. And he will not lose any of you that he's initiated his love on you. Right? <clears throat> the sovereign work of Yehovah. So we have this physical understanding. Right? We all understand physically. Don't need slides or anything. Right? That is along the same line as the spiritual. Birth is the beginning of life, and it 
<clears throat> necessarily begins before the existence of the one being born. So from the beginning of time, when he set his love on you, he knew that you would follow him. And because he knew that you would follow him, then his love that was set on you created a birth. But it took some activity and time for it to be seen. But when it is seen, you are someone of new life. So you want to make sure that you're not born of denomination or not born of just wanting to be a part of something that the father has initiated his love on you. So to be born of Yehovah means this. It means to be born by Yehovah's power and activity. <clears throat> Let me remind you, you cannot come stand here and say, I want to be a member. And I cannot, by you wanting to be a member, cause you to be born again. Can't do it. You cannot come any other way. You cannot go into the water and come out new. That doesn't happen. You can only be born by the initiating of the Father who has sent himself to you, overshadowed you like Mary, and brought forth a son. You are his children, and he initiates that love so that you can be born. His activity and his power. Or to be born of Yehoah means to be spiritually procreated by him. He's the one that has caused you to have life. You don't have it in yourself. <clears throat> Which is why we need to learn to love him with our heart, soul, and mind. And what gets us in trouble sometimes is that we forget that we weren't born of our own selves. And then sometimes when we forget that, we start living our lives like it's our own strength. When you say, oh, Lord, I failed you, I just want to quit, I failed you. He says, I knew you would fail me. You, you will always fail me if you're always trying to do it on your own, if you let me do it. When I am weak, he is what? He is strong. Let him do it. <clears throat> and how do you let him do it? By surrendering yourself to him, by dying to yourself. So even as a human child cannot be conceived apart from a father, right, so no one is able to come into the family of Yehovah, a child of Yehovah, apart from Yehovah having initiated that process. Which in today's world, we're just trying to build something instead of letting the Father initiate something. This is what John is saying. He's saying that the one who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah has come to this faith because Yehovah has initiated spiritual life. And then drawing that person to him through the sovereignty of his grace. That's why you sit here. You did nothing. He did everything. If he didn't initiate it, you wouldn't be born. So those born of Yehovah then have a right to address him as father and view themselves as his children. Remember when he was talking to the Pharisees and they said, uh, you know, <clears throat> our father Abraham, he said, who's your father? Our father Abraham, he says, your father's not Abraham. <laughs> your father's the devil. Well, that's one way to break up a conversation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And here's the thing about us today. <clears throat> We're so worried about offending and hurting people and being politically correct that we have, we have understood that to withdraw the truth from people. And when you withdraw the truth from people, then there's no sense that they have to change or no sense of conviction or guilt. Well, we just don't want to judge. Well, if you don't judge, because judge, that word judge gets a bad rap. You know, Elijah had a hard time with Jezebel. Why? Why? Because he told her the truth. John the Baptist had a hard time, or Herod had a hard time with John. Why? I'm telling you the truth. Now, she could have came from the back. Don't judge us. He understood the truth, and the truth is this. This is truth. What you're doing is not truth. I need to tell you this is not truth. 
I'm not telling you this is not truth to make you man. I'm telling you this is not truth to get you right. Because eternity is in the, is in the balance. This is not that you just missed something or you didn't get an ice cream cone. or <clears throat> This is eternity. And we need to be people of truth. Now, it doesn't mean that you go around telling everyone, you know, hello, you're a sinner, hello, you're wretched, hello, turn or burn. But you certainly have enough people that are in your life that bring something to your life that at least with love and concern and compassion, you can tell them truth. I'm not saying you have to tie them up and drag them. I'm just saying you, with love and compassion, say, that's wrong, that's wrong thinking, that's not the word of God, that's not, the, you cannot enter heaven like that. You cannot maintain that lifestyle and continue on. There has to be some change in your life. So, born of Yehoah gives us the right to be, to call him father, and then <clears throat> view ourselves as his children, which then views the community of believers in Yeshua. The ecclesia that he promised to build. Uh, Matthew 16, 18. I don't know if I have that up there. Yeah. I also tell you this. You are Kepha, which means rock. And on this rock, I will what? Build my community. And the gates of Sheol will not overcome it. <clears throat> so he's talking about this household of faith. There's an importance of the household of faith. Because you need siblings to help you. Rub you the wrong way sometimes. Tattle on you. Mom. Shut up. But how many times have you tattled on someone and really got them out of trouble? Because if you wouldn't have said anything, they would have been a, a heap of trouble. Now, you might have had to pay the penalty for it. You know, your arm got bruised when the parents weren't looking. Ephesians 2, 19 and 22. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers. On the contrary, you're fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's family. You have been built on the foundation of the emissaries of the prophets with the cornerstone being Yeshua, the Messiah himself. In union with him, the whole building is held together in how is the whole building held together? In union with him. So that means in a crowd of a thousand, <clears throat> there might not be a thousand sisters or brothers or children of God. So that doesn't mean the whole building. It means the building of those children. In union with him, the whole building is held together and is grown into a holy temple in which in union with the Lord, yes, in union with him, you yourselves are being built together into a spiritual dwelling place for God. In union with him. He keeps saying it over and over again. In union with him. In union with him. In union with him. In union with him. Which means you have to have what? Union with him. And because we're children, this is the exciting part. Because we're children, we all have equal access to him through Yeshua. And all have the abiding ruach to enable us to persevere in our faith and grow in likeness to Yeshua, walking in his footsteps. Now, I told you a story. You know, Pastor Kenny's moving down to this office where the big picture window was, where my mother was. You all remember my mother? And my mother had that window, and I was upstairs. And if you went by her window to go upstairs, what would she do? She'd come get you. Don't, no, 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 no. She had to make sure I would receive you. And she would do that to my children. I had to tell my mother, Mom, my children always have access to me. You never have to say, stop. They have access. Same way with the grandchildren. They have access. You have, because you're a child of God, access. To who? To the Father. <clears throat> but just because you're in the house doesn't mean you have access. Only a child has access. 1 John 5, 1. <clears throat> everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah has God as his father, and everyone who loves the father loves his offspring too. How many love the father? Let me see your hands. I want to see your hands if you love the father. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be like, mm. Okay, just checking. Well, then look around, because if you love the Father, you have to love every single person that's in this place. Now look around, everybody. Look at them. Whether they get on your nerve or not. Whether they get on your last nerve or not. Whether you're married to them or not. I could paraphrase it by saying this. <clears throat> Everyone who believes that Yeshua is the Messiah has God as his Father, and each one who loves the Father has a commitment to love one another 
as well. You have a what? A commitment to love one another. What did your parents say? If you had more than one sibling, what did your parents say? Love your siblings. They are your brother and your sister. I don't care how much they get on your nerves. And what do they do? They fight, they roll, they hit, scream and yell and cry. And what do you say? But they're your family. But I don't love them. You have to love them. They're part of you now. They're not some stranger. You have to love them. They're in your family. What are you going to do? Get rid of them? Put them in a basement? What? Guess what? You have a commitment. You raise your hand and you love the father. Then that means you have to love his offspring. You don't bring forth another child and tell the sibling, do you want this one or not? You have a re- we have a return policy. If you don't get along, we'll try again. No, you're stuck. How many know in your families are all different personalities? Isn't that right? All the bad traits are Gail's and all the good traits are mine. Isn't that how it is in your family? Right? Don't you say you're acting just like your mother or you're acting just like your father? And when they're doing good, you're like, see, that's my child. I'm so proud. <clears throat> so what, what does John do? John links faith and love. You cannot have true saving faith and not have love. You can't do it. They're linked. And anyone who has been born of Yehovah has been transformed, made new with a life that seeks to give allegiance to Yehovah who has rescued <clears throat> the sinner, transformed them by means of having died with Messiah and risen with him to a new life. So saving faith produces a genuine love for Jehovah, a love that is a commitment of life to honor and serve him with all your heart, soul, and might. Now, we have some military people in here, and I'm sure you took an oath, right? And the oath was to what? Say it louder, I can't hear you. To defend your country. And you're to honor, right? And serve. So when they say, I want you to go do this, you don't say, listen. I just don't feel like it today. Send this one over there. So our commitment to, you, to Yeshua, a genuine love for our Father, is that we are committed to a life of honor. How will I honor you? How can I serve you? Because without you, I wouldn't have this new life. Listen, never forget that you're sitting here and have eternal life and a new life. Even though you're going through struggles and things and situations, you still have a new life. You have eternal life. You have grace and mercy been applied to your life. You should give him a commitment of life, of honor, and servitude because of who he is and what he's done for you. Because you wouldn't be sitting here. So let me wrap it up by saying... John's point that's very obvious. If we have come to love Yehovah for all the bounty of grace and mercy he's given to us, and you sit here with a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. I stand here with a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. Most of us, if we didn't have grace and mercy, would be puffs of smoke. (laughs) We'd have to continually get new people because I'd be like, what happened to sister and brother? They they, blew up. You'd have to get a new pastor all the time. Right? I'm thankful that you didn't say right. Thank you. I appreciate that. (laughs) If we come to love Yehovah for all the bounty of grace and mercy he's given to us, then the love of Yehovah enables us to love others who are our sisters and our brothers in the family of Yehovah. Isn't it true for any of you that have siblings Some people have a hard time loving your children, but guess what? You, though you don't like it, though they do things that bother you, guess what is still there in your life? They are yours. You gave birth to them, and you love them. You want to wring their neck sometimes, right? 
You want to just own them sometimes? You want to say who? Oh, oh, no, we've never had any children. But you can't deny it. You love them, right? How many times does he want to wring your neck? Disown you? Who? I don't know them. But he fights for you because he loves you. And if he can love you like that, then cannot we also extend that mercy and grace to our brothers and our sisters? Right? Seems that John's teaching goes back to the very words of Yeshua himself. And I'll close with this scripture, John chapter 13, 35. It's a very simple scripture. It says, everyone will know that you are my Talmudim or my disciples by the fact that you have, say it. It's hard to say it. <laughs> it's hard to get it out of your mouth sometimes. They will know that you are my disciples. It's a very important link there. They will know your true saving faith. Because if you're a disciple, that means you follow him. They will know that you have true saving faith by the way you love each other. Now, you love each other by encouraging, by rebuking, right? You don't just, you encourage, you rebuke, you tell them when they're doing right, you tell them when they're doing wrong. Thing is, you just can't always tell people what they're doing wrong because then apparently you have something in your eye that needs to be taken out. Right? But we're working together. Brothers and sisters that eat the same table, argue in the same living room, fight in the same bedroom, wrestle in the same front yard, but at the end of the day, still what? Still love each other. <clears throat> It's a lot in John 5, verse 1. Amen? Let's do it. All right, hallelujah. Any questions? All right, let's stand before Yehovah. He is good. Get ready to love on someone. <laughs> Jimmy Dean, I can hardly walk. Someone needs to love on him. Help him walk. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't forget, <clears throat> regular service on Saturday, eating a sukkah that afternoon. Then we come back on Monday night at 6 p.m., bring a covered dish. And then we'll come in for service at 7 to finish the Feast of Sukkot and Simcha Torah, dance around with the Torah. Amen. Yehovah, you are the most high. You are the most high. Yehovah, you are the most high. You are the most high. Yehovah, You are the most high. You're the most high, God. 
You are the most I am. You are the most I am. You are the most I am. Enjoy the rest of your Sukkot. See you all on.